The following program is an original production of WICC PBS Chicago. Tonight, federal workers are back on the job, but is moving from crisis to crisis anyway to run a government. Church, state, and same-sex marriage, the rocky relationship between some church leaders and advocates of gay rights. Is it stalling same-sex marriage in Illinois? And from the streets to the stage, we'll preview a provocative new play about sex trafficking in Chicago. It's been called emotional and riveting. We'll show you why. These stories tonight and much more on In The Loop. I'm Barbara Pinto. And I'm Chris Bury. Tonight, a closer look at the role of religious groups in the battle over same-sex marriage in Illinois. What is the line between scripture and homophobia? Lawmakers and protesters return to Springfield next week with the possibility the House could finally vote on the controversial measure that Governor Quinn pledged to sign into law. The battle lines are drawn. Opponents include a coalition of powerful religious groups, among them the Roman Catholic Church and many African-American congregations. Tonight we hear from the voices shaping the debate and from a couple whose future hangs in the balance. The whole reason to have a wedding is a celebration. Right. We want to celebrate each other. We want to celebrate all our friends and family that have supported us. Jacob Leatherman and Nathan Holgate met eight years ago, working on a cruise ship. They've sailed around the world together and now call Chicago home. We live here. We love this city. It's our favorite place in the whole world. The only thing missing, they want to be legally married. But for same-sex couples, Illinois only allows civil unions. To say you have a civil union and to not be able to say you're married to the person you love and the person you've spent your life with and you plan to, you start to feel so marginalized that you just don't matter. But opponents of same-sex marriage see things differently. Many view the push for same-sex unions as an attempt to redefine the sacrament of marriage in a way that defies religion and nature. Our position is that our law should reflect our values, and our values should be that men and women come together for the purposes of creating children, and marriage acts as an institution to protect those children. I don't need you to open your doors and let us come waltzing down the aisle and marry in your church. I just need you to realize that I'm a human being and you're a human being and we deserve the same rights. The bill before the Illinois House does give religious organizations the freedom to opt out of performing same-sex marriages. But a recently published book entitled Homophobia in the Black Church, How Faith, Politics, and Fear Divide the Black Community, suggests the issue goes beyond a matter of rights. The book alleges that some religious leaders are fomenting a culture of homophobia in the black community. This is coming from someone who, uh, who really uh, does not know the black church. Bishop Lance Davis leads a congregation of about 200 people at the New Zion Covenant Church in South Suburban Dalton. Even after God had given him plenty of both, he still had hundreds of wives and concubines, and oh, and not one of them was a man. Bishop Davis has been an outspoken critic of same-sex marriage, but firmly rejects the notion that there is widespread homophobia in the black church. I believe that who has ever brought about this title or this phrase of homophobia within the black church has an ulterior motive, but it is not to portray the black church for what the black church really is. A spokesman for the Catholic Archdiocese also maintains there is no homophobia within the Catholic Church and that the Archdiocese has a long-standing record of supporting gays and lesbians. The Archdiocese has the, a GLOW program, the Archdiocese, the Archdiocese and Gay and Lesbian Outreach Program. That's been around since I think it was Cardinal Bernadine's years. Um, we have courage programs to help people who have homosexual orientations, to help them deal with those, those feelings. Well, clearly the, the church you know, wants to wants to change homosexuality and wants to to remedy and rehabilitate but all that says is that you're still wrong and that you're not really going to be included unless you change. Meanwhile, Bishop Davis contends that there are bigger issues to worry about than the rights of gays and lesbians and he's critical of President Obama for coming out in support of same-sex marriage. 
he is out of touch with our real struggle because our struggle is not same-sex marriage. Our struggle is on this corner. We had seven murders in seven weekends consecutively. That's my reality. So the president is out of touch with our reality. Joining us today is Anthony Stanford, Sun-Times Media West columnist and author of Homophobia in the Black Church, How Faith, Politics, and Fear Divide the Black Community. Anthony, welcome. Thank you for having me. We saw on the piece Bishop Davis said, you don't know the black church. Your response? Well, my response is that while I'm not and have not been a member of the black church, I am a black man and have lived in the black community for all of my life. Um, I might agree with, uh, with the reverend that I am not intimately involved in the black church, but I do understand that the position taken by some African-American clergy is not in keeping with what is equality for the entire community. In the research you've done for this book, where is the line between scripture and homophobia? Well, the, the line is that the, I think that most of the religious uh, entities, anti-gay activists who are against changing the law to permit um, equality marriage in Illinois um, comes out of the fact that they do not have not really captured and understand where some of the animosity comes from. I believe some of that animosity comes from, I can't speak for Reverend Davis, but I certainly can't speak to the fact that some African American leaders, that, uh, bishops and clergy that I've talked to are going back to what they experienced in boyhood, coming up as a young African American uh, person how they were taught to believe that homosexual, hom homosexuality was not right, that it was a wrong, something wrong and something that should be um, shunned. And that some have turned the corner and some understand that to legalize same-sex marriage is not to tamper with the biblical meaning that they, so, that they believe in. Um, others, however, have not made the adjustment and are not willing to make the adjustment. Now, the battle over same-sex marriage has kind of uh, sparked a collaboration between the archdiocese mm -hmm. and between some African-American churches uh, who've joined forces to oppose this measure. In a column you wrote, you call this an unholy alliance. Why? Yes. Well, because typically this is not something that you see. You don't see the African-American clergy overall having a rallying around a cause other than this, and they rally around some causes, and I, and I won't pretend that they don't, but this one they seem to be in a very cohesive and standing strong in their opposition to House Bill 110. Um, however, um, what they face is recent statements by uh, Pope Francis, who is sort of throwing a monkey wrench in their in their movement or in their stand against uh, same-sex marriage. And in doing so, African-American clergy and the uh, Catholic Church find themselves in a quandary and something that they're, try I believe, trying to figure out right now how they proceed given the Pope's uh, uh, recent conciliatory statements toward gays and uh, equal op e equality for gays in, the, in church. Now to clarify, the Pope said, if a person is gay and seeks God will, God's will, who am I to judge? Yes. In taking a look at what's going on in Springfield, we have this coalition of religious groups. Just how influential are they on what's going on there when it comes to same-sex marriage? Well, they've been very influential. Um, the last vote, I think, um, that came before the House, there were 50 um, votes for same-sex marriage. To, for the vote to, to pass and for it to become law, it would take 60. Um, they're in a position where they are still trying to, and now I'm talking about those advocates of same-sex marriage, trying to persuade those who have uh, sort of backed away from voting for the measure. Um, so it's very important. The Pope statement is very important as is the willingness for those who are sitting on the fence to eventually 
determined that equality for all Illinoisans is the most important thing. Now, at the crux of this seems to be the 20 Democratic lawmakers that are in the uh, Black Caucus mm -hmm. that was once led by Pastor James Meeks, yes. uh, who left office in January. How strong is his influence being felt there even after his departure? I believe Meeks' uh, influence is still being felt. Um, what Meeks has been around this issue for many years. Meeks, uh, as a matter of fact, was named by the Southern Poverty Law Center as one of the most homophobic black ministers in America. And so given that, those credentials, if you want to call it that, um, he still has influence, he's still involved, and the, uh, the coalition, uh, along with Cardinal Francis George, is not about to give up their fight to make sure that the bill does not pass uh, this fall. When it comes to marriage equality, is this a civil right? You know, that's been argued, and I, from the very beginning, uh, while it may be, in some minds, a civil right. I believe that um, the anti, or I'm sorry, the advocates for uh, same-sex marriage probably should have stayed away from using um, it as a civil right. In other words, pushing it forward, using civil rights as the catalyst to do so. Because in doing so, they alienated some of the uh, mainstream African-American leaders in this country, uh, Reverend Je Jesse Jackson, and others who, because of their background and their experience, cannot conceive of um, e marriage equality as being connected in any way to civil rights. So I, I deem it as more a human right. And I believe that that is the road that uh, is finally being taken and that anti-gay activists recognize that and that that is going to, in many ways, change their approach and f as far as pro-advocates go, I believe that they, they also believe that they are on a better track to success. Do you think this issue will come up in the veto session? What are your predictions for the next week or so? Well, you know, I try to stay away from predictions, but uh, I, I do. I recently talked with Greg Harris, who we know is a sponsor of the bill here in Illinois, and he believes that the measure is going to come up um, in the veto session. The march on Springfield is scheduled for, I believe it's next Tuesday, October 22nd, which happens to be the first day of the veto session. A lot to keep an eye on. Anthony, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Now for other trending stories this week. The federal government reopens for business and Rahm Emanuel's war chest keeps growing. Here's Chris with more. Thanks, Barbara. In addition to those stories, a startling new study uncovers some disturbing stats about Chicago crime and a familiar face is leaving our area. A longtime Chicago grocery is waving goodbye. 72 Dominic stores in the city and suburbs will close next year. But in this crowded grocery market, how much will Dominic's be missed? No, I don't shop at Dominic's. They will be missed only because, you know, people are losing out on jobs that uh, may be crucial for them. Mayor Emanuel has already stashed $5 million for his 2015 campaign. The teachers union says he'll need every dime but who will run against him? The only way that there's gonna be a mayoral candidate that you know, can go up against Rahm Emanuel is if he or she um, has the charisma to really like tap into a lot of public anger that's against the mayor right now. Why Chicago's police superintendent wants tougher gun laws. A University of Chicago study reveals even first-time gun offenders are more likely to be arrested for murder. That kind of seems like a no-brainer since, I mean, the, if they've already done something bad, uh, gun-related, uh, people tend to go back to jail after they've been there once. Superintendent McCarthy says that data makes clear that we have to treat illegal gun possession as the violent crime it is. And joining us this week are Kristen McQuarrie, editorial board member for the Chicago Tribune, Ginger Birkenbuehl, president and CEO of Burke Design, Inc., and public relations consultant Michelle D'Amico. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. So Thank the you. federal workers are back, and we're not going to have a default, at least for now. Michelle, should we be cheering this oh, news? Oh, I, I told someone yesterday, I'm so fed up I could spit. <laughs> it's so frustrating what we've endured over the last 16 days and then to read 
that we've racked up $24 billion in, in losses to our economy over those 16 days. And to think that we're going to have to go through this all over again, starting in January. I, and also what frustrates me is to hear members of the Tea Party in Congress saying they're still going to fight Obamacare. They don't sound at all remorseful. They still feel rejuvenated that they're con going to continue to fight what is now the law of the land. It well, just it's, it's, you know, it is interesting. You make the point that although the government is back to work, the can has been kicked down the road again, and the funding only runs through January 15th, and the debt ceiling is only going to be raised until February, Ginger. So it looks like we're going to get through the holidays and be right back in this mess. Yes, I think I'm delighted that it's over. Um, I was really concerned from a small business owner, you know, how eventually is this going to affect my business and the people that work for me? I also feel that um, it makes me wonder for foreign investors what they think about our country if we're stable because we have what appears to me a rogue group of people that are holding us hostage, all of us, everybody, from the government worker you know, to um, a small business owner with just a concern about what the future holds. So I'm delighted that it's over. I agree with everything you said. And, and I'm not looking forward to this happening again in January. I just think that the last time there was a government shutdown, um, they lost and I in the midterm elections. And I think it, I hope it happens again because we really need people to have more moderation um, with their approach to our government, our powerful, you know, leader government. Well, and one thing I found interesting in um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, told the Wall Street Journal this morning in the paper that um, they're going to start looking at moderate Republican candidates to support. They didn't make that distinction last election. That'll be interesting when the primaries roll around. Right. Yep. Kristen, you know, this started out from the Republican side as a way to defund Obamacare, the Affordable Health Act. Did the Republicans basically fail and capitulate on that? Yes, they did. Um, but, I, but I disagree with some of what my fellow pa panelists are saying. Um, using Obamacare and holding the country hostage and, and threatening default was a terrible strategy by the far right of the Republican Party. But being concerned about our $17 trillion debt and the fact that we are so cavalier about raising the debt ceiling and have been for decades, I'm glad that we will be talking about this again over the, last, over the next three months. I'm happy that it was not extended as the original proposal that we would be looking, we would be giving a full year for before we would be revisiting. We need to be talking about entitlement reform. We need to be talking about Medicare reform, Social Security. We cannot just keep raising the debt ceiling and then going on our merry way. So I'm actually glad that we had some resistance in Congress to doing that. Connecting it to Obamacare, terrible strategy. Getting us talking about it, smart. But doesn't that leave us in the position of having to keep going through this crisis after crisis if they only raise the debt ceiling a few months at a time? It does. I mean, that's what happened with sequestration. They set up a super committee and they weren't able to solve the problem. And we actually went through sequestration. And other than, you know, the Blue Angels not flying at the air show, I think Americans will probably be hard pressed to think in a year from now when they're at the ballot box how sequestration was such a bad thing. I don't know that that won't be the same situation here. I'm hoping that if we have level-headed um, budget gurus like Paul Ryan at the table actually talking about real spending cuts that we won't be, you know, back in this position in January. We actually have bipartisan agreement on how to move this country forward and start chipping away at that debt. we got to move from uh, Washington down to local politics and City Hall. Mayor Emanuel has a war chest already. The election's not until 2015, and Rahm Emanuel already has $5 million, a lot more than the governor has. Is this to scare away any potential opponents, you think, Michelle? Politics is survival of the fittest, and the money that you collect is what makes you fit and strong. Last time around, Emanuel collected $14 million in campaign contributions. He's a third of the way there, and he is, he's obviously working to eliminate his opponents. Ginger, the teachers union has come out and said that Emmanuel, quote, is going to need every damn dime. What do you make of that? Um, I think that he will need every damn dime, but I also think he can get another damn dime anytime he'd like. <laughs> so I think that one of the things I respect about Mayor Emanuel, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Mayor Bloomberg, that he has some independent wealth and he's not so attached to 
other people to help him get some of the things that he needs to get done. We have some really difficult challenges in the city, so I think it's very important that he has a wide network that he's developed over decades and decades of working in Washington and working locally. It's very important that he has these strong relationships. I mean, he raised in six months with um, a black businessman in Chicago almost $50 million in less than six months. That's pretty powerful. When have we ever had a mayor that's been able to do that in Chicago? So Chris, I think Kristen, that it's important. Kristen, do you think that, that given, given that I'm sorry to interrupt, but we, okay. we have to move on a little bit, does that mean that uh, another opponent, a, a strong opponent, is unlikely with that kind of a war chest? That's the goal. I mean, I think that's the number one goal of raising this money this early is to keep people out because that's not just money that Rahm Emanuel can spend on himself reminding us of the things he's done as mayor. That's money that can be spent trashing an, another opponent. So you don't want to go up against a war chest unless you have some sort of equal footing because he'll just he'll tear you down with that kind of money. One of the big issues that he's facing beyond the schools, which of course the, the teachers union is upset about, is gun violence. He and the police superintendent McCarthy are citing this new study from the University of Chicago, which says basically that people even with minor gun possession or, uh, uh, records are likely to go out and commit more violent crimes. But in a city with so many illegal guns, is it going to make a difference, Michelle? I, I don't think anything will make a difference unless there's a control on gun unless there are stricter gun laws, is my opinion. Um, what are we talking about? Are we talking about making it tougher for repeat offenders, sending them back to jail, building more prisons? Yes, that's, that's more, what they're talking asking about. Asking taxpayers to pay more for prisons? I don't think there's an easy solution to any of this. I find this conversation really challenging because I think that the idea that um, now that we are able to carry concealed weapons, it changes my relationship when I'm walking down the street with oh. my three children <laughs> because I'm worried more. Um, anything too. that they can do, any mm -hmm. small moves that can be made are helpful, although I'm not really understanding how that can work with the law of the land that the Supreme Court put out because I feel like if they're going to try to control guns on a local level, doesn't that mean that someone like the NRA can come in and say, well, you can't really do that? You mentioned the, uh, the concealed carry law, and one part of that is taking effect where restaurants and bars now have the option of putting a sign. The state of Illinois, Kristen, has already given out the official banned gun um, sign. Do you think that um, that is an option that's going to make a difference if these business owners get to put these signs in the windows? I think it's their right to do so. Um, if you've ever been to Wisconsin, they have concealed carry. Uh, just on the door when you go into a restaurant above the MasterCard and Visa, there's a little sign that says no weapons allowed. It's not onerous. It's not disruptive. Um, I think businesses have a right to keep weapons off their premises. Um, I think that the law that they're talking about tightening unlawful use of weapons, it doesn't make sense to me why they wouldn't pass this because there is enough data and this and the study from the University of Chicago Crime Lab shows that these are people who recidivate at a rate higher than other felons. And we've had two cases in Chicago, Hadia Pendleton and the back of the yard shooting, where you had people who were either on probation or got boot camp and had UUW convictions. Judicial discretion on this subject is not working. And so we need to tighten the law to make sure that you are caught with a gun, a loaded gun, in public without a FOID card. You have a three-year minimum prison sentence. I don't care if you're a hunter in Carbondale or you're a kid in Chicago. You. The, the idea that the prisons will fill up, I think, is partially erroneous because once people know that you will get caught with a weapon, you will have fewer people carrying illegally if they know that there are consistent laws that are going to put them behind bars. We have, we have to go from uh, guns to groceries. A famous <laughs> name in Chicago, uh, Dominic's uh, familiar to everybody who's lived here for any um, amount of time, leaving 70-some uh, stores, closing, mm -hmm. closing 6,000 people, uh, going to lose their jobs. But I wonder, Michelle, does this news make as much difference as it might have 10 or 15 years it ago? It doesn't make a difference because the competition has eaten Dominic's lunch. <laughs> the competition has taken over and attracted, provided so many more options for grocery shoppers that can not only find, a, find dinner and find uh, great services that Dominic's and Jewel just aren't delivering right now. And Ginger, do you see that fragmentation at the low end? We kind of have Aldi and Walmart and then Jewel in the middle and all these high-end Whole Foods and Mariano's. It seems like they're just everywhere. They are everywhere. And personally, I never 
enjoyed shopping at Dominic's, although I feel terrible Me neither. for the workers. I feel mm -hmm. awful for one of my clients who holds a lot of property where Dominic's is the anchor tenant. Um, although they have tremendously amazing buildings, they'll be able to get another tenant very quickly. Um, on the other hand, I always felt like Dominic's didn't have the greatest customer service, and their produce department didn't really stand up to my standards. So, you know, so having, you're not shedding many I'm tears. I'm not shedding no. tears. I, I, I love the new options that we have available. I always felt Dominic's also was a, at a higher price point by comparison to Jewel, which is sort of Me my go-to store. Me too. Um, if I'm looking for really, really high-end meats, I go to whole paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen, uh, last word is going to go to you. Some good news we heard is that Jewel's going to buy at least four of these stores and hire about 450 workers. Yeah, I mean, that's what worries me is the is the other tenants that are in some of these anchor malls and just the fact that we're going to have all of these big boxes sitting there. So I'm hopeful that someone will take over. I have a Dominic's near my house, but I, I also think, I agree, this is just, this is, this is free markets. I mean, people choose where they want to grocery shop and Dominic's just was not able to keep up. On that uh, note, uh, it's time for lunch, I think. So we have to wrap this up. <laughs> Kristen McQuery, Ginger Birkenbuehl, and Michelle D'Amico, thank you for your time tonight. We appreciate that. Sex trafficking, it's a $32 billion illegal industry where more than 100,000 girls and young women nationwide and thousands in Chicago are forced into the life each year. Now a local director is putting a spotlight on trafficking in a provocative new play. My kind of town, Chicago is. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. Perhaps what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. <laughs> Simple, baby. Money for the honey. The stage play Shadow Town dramatizes the startling truth. How girls as young as 11 are lured from malls, enticed by online predators, even sold by their parents into the scary world of sex trafficking. The audience will go through 10 lessons on how to become the master of the game. You're seeing that journey is taken uh, through with the eyes of the pimp. And uh, you see how those girls start. One is from the west side of Chicago, one is from uh, Naperville, one is from Humboldt Park, and one is from Asia. In the beginning, they see how the girl got there to begin with, how the trafficker manipulates them to get there. Peaking! Fine. She doesn't speak English yet. Well, make sure she knows what $750 means. These are all based on actual stories and interviews with these individuals um, or individuals who dealt with these girls. So the actors turn those ugly truths and tragic personal stories into compelling characters on stage. I play Renee, and she's known as the bottom girl. Uh, she's the head, kind of the head prostitute with Prime and she helps him recruit, she helps, you know, keep the girls in line, but she's, she's his number one person, but she's also bears the grunt of a lot of his anger. What else you got for me? Tatiana. Get back to work. And this is serious, serious human slavery. We don't see it. We could walk by it and not know it. And they're like ghosts. They're invisible to us. And that wraps up our show for this week. You are now in the loop. The conversation continues on WYCC.org. To learn more about In the Loop, our stories, our guests, or to view past episodes, check out our website at WYCC.org. Until next week, I'm Barbara Pinto. And I'm Chris Bury. Good night.